Hey guys, on today's episode, we're gonna be going over the step-by-step -step process for changing the color of your car's interior without replacing the leather itself in a process called dyeing. So we're gonna go from this old ratty tan color over to this beautiful cinnamon. And I'll show you how to do that today on this episode of Drive and Protect. Have you ever been on the internet and found a cool car at an amazing price only to realize the interior is uh, unique to say the very least? Reupholstering the entire interior is obviously a lot of work, prohibitively expensive and sometimes impossible to find your desired colored leather or the replacement part in that color at all. But there's actually another way. The color can be changed without reupholstering or paying for new parts and can be done with a limitless color palette all for less money than reupholstering. Today, I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina at the shop of Brian Marks from Fibernew to watch the step-by-step -step process to transform the interior color of any car. To complete a project of this size, the first step is pretty obvious. Remove all the parts that require a color change. In our case, this is a 1995 E34 5 Series with an engine from a later E39 M5 and a brand new paint job, so the car is highly modified, but the interior is a bit tired with mismatched colors and, in some areas, wrong parts as well as broken and missing pieces. The Fiber New team has a bit more work than usual on this labor of love. First is the front seats, then the back seats, center console, door panels, steering wheel, dashboard, and so on was removed from this Frankenstein interior, leaving behind a nightmare of wires and confusion. However, Nick is a BMW master tech, so this was all controlled chaos to him. More on this later. With all the parts out of the car and on various tables, step two is a serious cleaning. First, all the parts are scrubbed with Fiber News concentrated all-purpose cleaner to remove surface dirt and contaminants. A power drill with a nylon brush can be helpful here, but I wouldn't recommend this level of aggression as a regular maintenance technique. In this case, we really needed to clean and scuff up the material in preparation for the dye in the next few hours. With the big areas getting cleaned, the smaller, more intricate pieces needed to be disassembled before they could be cleaned properly. During this process, Brian noticed the doors had been re-dyed in the past with an amateur rattle can process. Notice the black overspray on the tan edges and the tan door pockets sprayed black. After the heavy scrubbing, the black is removed, revealing more of the original tan underneath. Next, the parts are put through another thorough cleaning process. Then a leather prep product is wiped on, allowed to soak into the material and then flash off, before wiping with another prep formula that encourages dye adhesion in the next steps. Once everything is prepped, the parts that need to be repaired are brought over to the other side of the shop, where Patrick and Brian are filling in any tears, holes, or cuts in the vinyl before dying. In this case, the door pocket has a gash in it that requires a special repair procedure for vinyl. The paste is applied and heated up, then textured, then reapplied, heated up, textured, and so on until it fills the gap as desired. Much the same concept or theory as Bondo and paint repair prior to repainting. However, for the record, this is not Bondo, so don't try that on your interior. Then Brian showed me a cool trick to repair faded red seatbelt release buttons. He first scrubbed the plastic clean, then slowly heated it up with a Steinel HL1910E with a direct nose cone for precise heating and a number wheel from 9 to 1 for an exact temperature setting. Typical high and low settings lack the precision needed for these types of pro repairs. Then, he sanded the tight spots with 600 grit and repeated the steps with a heat gun. Now, this is a very effective process but wildly unforgiving if you overheat the area. So if you choose to do this, work slowly. With all the parts prepped and repaired, the next step is to dye the material. For an effective color change, there needs to be at least four to six coats to mask the previous color. To do this, Brian first filters the dye into a smaller bottle with a metal mesh screen to remove any solids in the liquid and to avoid any possible contamination in the future. Once satisfied, the jar is secured to an airbrush and all the seams are dyed with a precise stream to thoroughly cover tight areas that are commonly overlooked. Next, the dye is put into a larger gun to cover larger areas and fewer passes. This process is repeated on every part. Much the same as a concourse paint job, the final results heavily depend on how well the body panel, or in this case, the leather, is prepped. On a side note, as you can see, Brian is using a white colored dye as sort of a 
primer, so to speak, and to help smooth the transition from black to cinnamon. Now, using a standard color like white as a transition color saves on the specially mixed dye for the final coats, which makes sense. Now, after each coat, the team dries the part with a hair dryer while Brian moves on to the next piece. Notice the masking tape on the top part of the door card. The owners decided to have the door multicolored. More on this later. On natural creases or seams on the seat bottom or the seat back, the team helps Brian by spreading the crack open while he lays down more dye to cover up any hidden areas. This type of fastidiousness is why the end result is virtually impossible to discern what is OEM and what has been dyed. After two or three coats of the white primer-ish dye, each panel is ready for the first layer of the customer's desired color. For the E34, he's chosen BMW's OEM Cinnamon. The special cinnamon dye and then the thinner are added to the paint gun and the first light coat is added to all the parts. For a project of this size and complexity, Brian decided to disassemble the seat side bolsters to ensure the dye covered every square inch and nothing would be seen by the customer if the seam was pulled open during an inspection. After each light coat, the team dried the parts with the hair dryer while they leapfrogged over each other to keep the project moving. On the other side of the shop, Nick was still disassembling the BMW to replace the carpet which was way past its prime. Now to do this, the owner actually purchased a junkyard donor BMW for the extra parts and pieces, including the rug, dashboard, and various clips and trim to complete his master project. Once all was removed, the floor is vacuumed and ready to accept the donor carpet. Nick and Paul reinstall the carpet and work all the wires and controls into the appropriate holes in preparation for the dashboard installation. So instead of dyeing the original dashboard, which could have easily been done, the owners chosen to replace that part completely with a slightly different style from the donor car, which was already black. Nick has already removed the original dashboard, but we're going to be reinstalling this other slightly different style dashboard in the car. Because the VIN number for the vehicle is attached to the dashboard itself, in order to keep everything correct for the owner, we're going to switch the VIN number from this dashboard to that dashboard. But after the VIN changed, they realized the air ducts were not compatible from the 91 donor to the 95 project car. So Nick had to remove and replace the old ducts with the new ducts to make it work, which was a completely different project in and of itself, but he made it work. The next day, while the team was preparing for the final coat, I asked Brian to summarize the most common types of leather he works with and how to tell the difference between them. A lot of people think that leather is leather, but that isn't necessarily the case. There are many different types, but in the wild, you generally see two different types. We've got aniline leather here, and we've got fully finished leather here. In your car, you most likely have this one, but some vehicles like the Ford King Ranch do have aniline leather for the seats. There's a very easy way to tell the difference. Doing a water test by dropping a little water onto the aniline versus dropping a little water onto the fully finished, you will see that the water soaks in to the aniline leather where it does not on the fully finished leather. Think about it like this. You've got a deck in your backyard. It's made of wood. You can stain it or you can paint it. If you want to see the grain of the wood, you stain it. That's your aniline leather. If you want to color your wood, say yellow or white or brown, that's your fully finished leather. That's, this, that's the simple difference between the two. So this is clearly fully finished leather, or what it's described as a painted deck in his example. The next step was to inspect the color coat for any missing spots or seams that, when exposed, are not completely covered in dye. These spots are typically overlooked and scream re-dye if found later by a discerning eye. So Brian has the guys expose every seam, prep the area, and dye the hidden spot for an undetectable finish. As a quick safety note, I asked why it was okay to spray dye outside of a spray booth. What I learned is that these dyes are water-based, non-toxic, and VOC compliant. The same idea as painting your home walls with waterborne paint. The overspray is very narrow or defined microscopic droplets that settle out quickly. The last step of the dyeing process is called the top coat. Think of it like your paint's clear coat. Here's a basic chart to see the similarities between repainting a car and re-dyeing an interior. The body of the car, or the metal, is equivalent to the leather or the vinyl. The primer is the same as the prep solution, the paint is the same as the dye, and the clear coat is the same idea as the top coat. Now the top coat is where it gets super interesting. If you notice, the seats, as they are right now, are extremely shiny, but the OEM seats have a muted or matte look to them. 
To match the original look and feel, Brian can mix any ratio of gloss and matte top coat with an activator to achieve the customer's desired sheen while protecting the material's finish, which is pretty cool. Here's a perfect example. I asked Brian to leave one side of the steering wheel column plastic dyed while the other with a top coat over it. After a few minutes of drying, look at the before and after. Although both clear coat and top coat increase each respective finish's durability, most paint jobs seek to increase the gloss with a clear coat, while the interior top coat looks to dull the gloss, which is the opposite of what you might think. Again, this can be regulated by the customer's desires. If he wants it glossy, Brian can make it glossy. If he wants it OEM, you can make it OEM. On the very last piece, I got to lay the final top coat myself to get a feel for how different or similar this is to painting a vehicle. To me, the same concepts or theories apply. Keep your arm 90 degrees from the surface, same distance away, 50% overlap, release the trigger as you come off the part, and so on. Your goal here is to avoid runs or thick coats while laying down enough to minimize dry spots or low areas. Once done, I used the hair dryer, but I learned a new trick that I'd never heard before. Okay. So these areas and this area back here can collect dust from the air. It's sucking it in. That's already in the air. When those particles get stuck to the screen and you turn the hairdryer on, the force from the air being sucked through the back can dislodge those particles. Before you put those particles into your wet top coat, mm -hmm. when you turn the hairdryer on, you're going to tap it a few times, then hold it steady away from the leather mm -hmm. until you're sure that there's nothing stuck or nothing will come out from being dislodged in the back, and then gently transition to the leather. Same as before, you hold the cord out, you don't want to get it on the, on the, on the wet top coat, and you just make an even pattern, nice and smooth, all the way through. With two layers of top coat on, the team reassembled the seats using hog rings, pliers, and lots of patience. While that was going on, Brian masked off the door panels to dye the uppermost part of the door where you would rest your arm in preparation for a fresh layer of black to create a two-toned door. Afterwards, he touched up the hidden spots with an airbrush and a small paintbrush when necessary. Now, with every part ready to go, the moment of truth is here, reinstalling all the parts and avoiding any bumps or scratches in the process. With the donor dashboard already in place, Nick and Paul install the new center console, e-brake housing, shifter boot, buttons, panels, and so on, while Brian and Jeff are reassembling each door panel in the other garage. Next, the original tan seatbelts are swapped out with the donor car's black ones and covered up with black trim to match. Then the glove box, steering column plastics, and passenger side front seat were reinstalled. At this point, this was the first time I could really see how well this project was going to turn out. The contrast between the two seats and the new floor looked fantastic. Then the upper back seat, the bottom cushion, and then the four door cards and window buttons were put back into place along with the brand new M Sport steering wheel, completing this total transformation in just a few days. After all this work, maybe you the viewer on YouTube, you don't care for the color, or maybe you think it wasn't worth the effort. That's totally understandable, but the finished product, that's hard to argue with. No matter what the color or the style you choose, the bottom line is this, it's actually possible. But the real question is, how much does it cost? A small hole or a seat bolster repair is usually a couple hundred dollars, while a fully custom complete interior can range into the thousands, but it's still typically way cheaper than traditional reupholstering. I'll post an email in the description below so that you can ask about pricing on your specific car and specific repair or upgrade to narrow down the pricing. Hey guys, well that's it. As you can see, the car looks absolutely phenomenal. This is not what I was expecting. Uh, when we were done, it's better than I thought. The difference between what was originally in here and what we have now is clearly night and day. And I wanna make a few points before we uh, get out of here. And the first one is, a lot of you have asked on Instagram, like, hey, how long is this gonna last? The way that Brian did it, it's gonna last at least equal to the OEM and probably even longer because we did so many steps and he's so fastidious about everything. Now. The flip side to that is if you find something that's a rattle can or whatever over the counter and you fix it on your, on your own, you may have some wear or uh, dye transfer, that kind of thing. But in this case, he put so many layers of top coat, which we showed before, this thing is super, I mean, it feels just like it did uh, you know, in the OEM. In fact, we compared it to that OEM car uh, a little while ago and it looks exactly the same. So 
the moral of the story for me is if whatever your imagination can come up with, you want green, purple, and yellow, fine, that can actually be done because you're mixing paint. But if you go in and you think, hey, I want to change the leather itself, not only is it you know, way more expensive, it's very challenging to fix uh, the door cards. That's where it kind of separates. So if you want to change and you have like this cool color scheme you want to do, the door cards are where it becomes challenging because you're not going to necessarily put leather all over the door cards. You follow what I'm saying? So doing this process, it's much faster, much cheaper, but it actually gives you more range uh, to kind of be creative with your car. So hopefully that makes sense. If you have any specific questions about the material or whatever, I'll put this link below and you can contact Brian and ask all the questions at Fiber New. Uh, the guys have been great. Lastly, as you could tell, there was a whole team of people that volunteered uh, to help Brian out and of course me to get this shoot done in a short period of time. So a huge thank you to everyone. Uh, I've met some really great people down here and I think I'm gonna be uh, you know, long time friends with them because they're just very, very sweet. So as always, if you guys found this video helpful, please subscribe. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.